I had a pretty interesting day today and I actually did a lot of writing. I'm not gonna read what I wrote today, but it's all pretty deep because it's about two different men that I've known for years and one who has risen up out of the ashes and the other one who's fallen down in the midst of the storm of his life. So um, I might talk about that for a minute, but I'm gonna read these scriptures here. Samuel knew that the Lord was with him and he didn't let any of his words fall to the ground. You know, when I started uh, making God's thoughts my thoughts <laughs> and owning my low thoughts, you know, my ways are not your ways, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my thoughts are higher, I decided to own up to my low thoughts and replace them with his high thoughts and it changed my whole life. Unless his judgments had become my delight, my soul would have perished in my affliction. So, you know, it's better it's better to let Jesus help us with our motives now um, so we can find help for the things that are really off in our life than have our sins find us out later. I want to talk about that too for a minute. But behold, Jesus was appointed for the fall and the rise of many so that the thoughts and motives and intentions of many hearts would be revealed. And you know, so I wanna talk about this story about two men, they both fell initially in, in their sins, but only one of them really has made it out in all these years um, by, by being open and honest and teachable. So uh, the other one ended up getting worse that I found out about today. So I wanna talk about how that happens a little but if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord and may you be sure that your sins will find you out. That's a pretty deep scripture in Numbers 23. And if you if you look it up, you can even find out what it's in reference to. Um, it's Numbers 23, so I'm gonna leave it on the page too. So I wanted to tell you, because where I wrote was called this wimp, uh, overcoming Satan and his desire for us, but we must master him. Facebook, Facebook page, you can find stuff there too. Um, and I wrote about these two men. I also talked to a young mother today and I got some great revelation from her. We also have a, a page, a Dropbox page with all kinds of audio videos. So I'm gonna leave a couple links to what's called a divine searcher because you know, God, there's all kinds of scriptures about God searching out the motive and intention of our hearts. So when we, when we don't face that, we just shipwreck everybody's life around us. You know, again, my father was a priest for had 12 years of the psychology and theology, but he couldn't separate himself. He couldn't sanctify himself for love's sake. Jesus said this in John 17, I separate and sanctify myself for the sake of others. So it's in our highest interest to love God with all of our heart and love our neighbor as ourself because we won't separate ourselves from what's off and wrong if we don't do that. And that's exactly the story, the two, the two uh, stories I wanted to talk about. I think I'll tell the story about the mom real quick though because I, I know a young mom and I knew her before her mother conceived her in her womb. So... Um, it's been a long journey and I think she might be even close to 30. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know why I think that, but again, when you know somebody that's a baby, it's hard to tell how old they are. <clears throat> so she's telling me this story where she got angry and then 30 minutes, I mean, 30 seconds later, her daughter's in her bedroom acting out the same kind of anger. And it was such a great little thing to talk about spiritual impartation because we're all imparting whatever spirit we're of, and we can't help it. And especially when you have kids, they're just <laughs> recipients of what we impart to them. So that's why we have to be careful. That's what that's what we're gonna face when we stand before Jesus. What, what do we impart to each other? Because, you know, I've had adults impart a lot of things that weren't right. And I've probably imparted some of those things to my children too, because we don't walk on water. But, you know, when I decided to really care about having a right spirit with my kids and trying to help them understand the battle of conscience, motive and intention, and that's where we connect to God. There's only one phone line and it's motive and intention. And we can't 
God's not even going to hear us if we're not going to be honest. So what I told her was, you know, you can learn something really valuable with your daughter here too. How much do you want to carve her, her conscience towards doing what's right? You know, being awake and alive in her conscience. And she said, yeah, that's what I'm all about. Even though I get selfish and act out selfishly with her, I want to back from it, back up from it and learn. And I said, you know, that's how you can know good God's good heart. And you can always talk to him about it. You're, no matter how bad off we are, if we're just honest with our motive and intention and we really want help, the Lord is good and he's going to help us. The problem is because, because we're evil, we have an evil heart of unbelief, right? And we don't believe that God wants to help us because we're selfish. So we're gonna, we have to own up to those things so we can actually even see who God actually is. <laughs> so if we don't have a motive and intention, conscience, relationship with the spirit of truth, the teacher, we will hide no, uh, none of his words in our heart to stop sinning against him, the Holy One. We have to hand over our words, our rocks, and get up some flesh, get some of his words that have spirit and life in them. And, you know, if we don't, do that. We don't, we aren't turning at his words and we're not going to have a map for anybody else, a roadmap with signs where we turn down. So how can we discern between those who serve God and those who don't serve God and just think it's a good idea? Fellowship is the evidence of love. So in first John, it says, if you say you have no sin, no selfishness, you deceive yourself. And he who is the truth isn't in you. So there are those that value Jesus and do this first John chapter one thing and those that don't do it. And it's the difference between faking fine and real fine. It's the difference between one man and another that I'm going to tell you a quick story about. So God said to Satan, sin deceived you and slew you. So if, if God's word is a lamp and a light, it should uh, help us up our game in motive and intention and, and purify our intentions, right? The quick, powerful word of God that divides motive and intention. Um, so if we're not even going to face our motive and intentions or tell the truth, we're pretty much just using Jesus to make us feel better about our selfishness and our sins. We're not getting close to God or each other, knowing grafted words that are saving our soul to share and be that common bond with each other. So uh, I've met quite a few people that are just using Jesus to make them feel better about their selfishness and don't even get that either. So back to the story about the two men. I've known them both, and I think Gene's known one of one of them he knew has known for 52 years. Not all that 52 years, but he met him that long ago. The other guy, I think he met about 40 years ago at least. So they're both, you know, getting older now and looking towards the end of their life. One of them very, very, very soon. And so um they happen to both have the same name. That's what's really bizarre. I was even talking about the one guy because I knew him in Europe and he, we went over there for two weeks twice, I think, and traveled around Europe together. And this guy was so shut down in a cocoon of fear and unbelief and not judging his motive and intentions. It's like a caterpillar all wrapped up in the cocoon. <laughs> and so I've seen him go from, you know, being really shut down to being teachable, being open, being sincere, you know, coming out of his sins and selfishness and the way he treated people, the way he thought about God, the way he thought about women, the way he thought about vices and destructions to really, you know, men love darkness more than light. Watching this guy see things the way they really are because he hasn't been in love with the powers of darkness so he stayed open he stayed teachable and it's really changed his life a lot so he sanctified himself a lot too just like Jesus said you know it's how we love each other and what happens then is when you actually understand your soul and your own demise your rebellion your fear your unbelief you can do what's right with people you can wash their feet with the words that you've hidden your heart so you don't sin and that's how we get our hands free from the blood of all men, free from being unforgiving, looking down on them, despising them, holding grudges, evil imaginations, you know, all that, to being innocent 
and because we've tried to help them become innocent before God. And you know, how tragic for people to live and die and we didn't really care about saving and keeping their soul. And we were content to bear grudges, offenses, look down on them. And really people that are like that, you, you can't help them. You know, you can't even talk to them because they're liars and they're prideful and they won't be honest and open. So this actually only works with people that are at least in the mode of an intention game and, and want to do what's right. Again, Derek Prince, Gene Sullivan, a lot of people say, until people are desperate, they're not going to hear what you have to say anyway because they don't care about their mode of an intention. They just care about their own personal happiness and greed. So um, back to the other guy. So I got a, a, an email about the other guy. A text today. Sorry, I need to take a drink here. This man came into Gene's life about 40 years ago. And he had serious problems too. Most men have problems with their appetites, their passions, their emotions, their desires, right? We all do. We need to be converted and saved. So this guy had even been put in prison for something he did. And he, he got let out over a really odd situation. I, I don't know what that was, but you know, when, in Jeremiah, it talks about the curse that we come under when we look to man, look to ourselves, look to people to make us better. We, we're cursed. We curse is the man that trusts the man, makes the arm of flesh their strength. They don't see when good comes, can't even see good. So people look to all kinds of things in the earth, you know, love creation, love all the things that creation offers, including trying to get people to fix them and save them. So that's the Jeremiah 17 curse, because when we don't push, put our trust in the Lord, then we don't ever turn into a, a planted field. We know it, it talks about this in Jeremiah 17. I just don't have it up right now, but you turn into a, a blossoming tree that has shade. You have life, you have peace, you have joy. When you're under the curse of trying to fix everything yourself and you don't need Jesus and you put your trust in man, whether it's you or people, it's all hell breaks loose because you can't ever get enough of people's salvation. You can't get extract what you need from people when you're we need God. We need to get what we need from God. He's the savior of the world, not man, not me, not you. So it all goes bad when that happens and all kinds of bias and destructions happen then. And that's exactly, this guy even went, he was pretty much uncorrectable. I think he was initially sorry when Gene met him and teachable, but that didn't last long because he still wanted to draw comfort in a illegal way, you know, we all have passions, appetites, emotions, desires. When you start being ungodly and fulfilling your appetites, passions, and emotions and desires, it all goes south. So this guy never really got a grip on that. And we can all use people for to meet our needs, whether it's any any kind of way. But I want to say specifically emotionally, spiritually, maybe even intimately with the opposite sex or same sex or children or whatever that is. So this guy's really gone south in that. And mo most people do have some kind of problems with <laughs> their sexuality, that they take out those problems on other people, or try to get them to fix them, help them, save them, whatever. The problem with this guy is he went to a third world country and he didn't have a lot of money, but you're rich even poor, poor Americans are rich in third world countries. So he could afford to buy rice in a third world country, which made him have a position of authority over people that were poor. And they kind of, you know, once, once that happens, a lot can go south because people that are hungry might close their eyes to a lot to get food from a foreigner. So there's a lot that's gone wrong with this guy because he, of loving the praise and honor that comes from man and not from God alone. It's so tragic. It's so sad. And Gina and I have been doing what we can to help these people because they're just the victims of somebody who won't separate himself from his sin. And, and that's really what I want to compel you to look at is to 
know that God is good and he's going to help us with your motives and he's going to help us see things clearly. I mean, I was terrorized. My, my father that was the priest was just overcome with everything, sexually, food, alcohol, you name it, drugs, cigarettes, alcohol. He was just overcome by all the vices of the flesh. And I was just terrorized thinking I was going to be like him because he was smart, intelligent, spoke different languages, um, had 12 years of psychology and theology. And he was totally overcome and died on skin. Couldn't separate himself from demonic activity for any anybody or anything if he tried because he he wasn't open and he wasn't teachable. And th those are maybe the two things that make people perfect and change their lives. That's what happened to this other guy. This guy turned into a butterfly that got his blood free, clean from the, he got his hands clean from the blood of all men because he gave them the full counsel of God. He gave them the words. He gave, he's traveled around for years giving people the words that he's planted in his own soul that have helped him stop sinning against God because that's really where it's at. Our salvation means nothing if we don't get God's engrafted words to save our rear end and we can't give those away. That's what our, every daily activity should be. And I think I'm going to end this now because God can give you the engrafted words of his living word to save your soul. He came to deliver us, to save us from the hand of the enemy with words. And so if we don't value his word, we're not going to go very far. You know, give me this day my daily bread. Deliver me from evil. Help me be separated and sanctified from evil thoughts, evil imaginations against God and against people so I can do what's right with people. <laughs> and, you know, I just pray that this message may help somebody because it's all playing out. You know, nobody takes on God and wins. Be sure your sins will find you out. Much better to deal with them now than to live a life of total shame because you and Jesus got a good thing going and everybody else can go down on your watch. I've met a lot of people like that too, sadly. And we're going to give an account to God for who we are in the here and now, here and now, here and now. And even alcoholics, they get over alcoholism by a couple things. They live in the now. They take on the now and they decide who they're going to be in the now to people in the now. And they get over the, it's too hard. I, it's like climbing Mount Everest, you know. They get out of the future and they take on the now. That's a key thing to spiritual life. And, you know, they have to, they have to give up the thoughts of how terrible they are, how bad they are, how condemned they are, how little Jesus is, how hard it is, you know, what losers they are, all, the, all those really junky thoughts to be able to just take on the now, I'm gonna do what's right in my now. Because those nows turn into the future. So I just pray that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done in your life, that you can glorify him and not some demonic spirit, some horrible vice that you're gonna play out in people's lives. God help us to not drag Jesus through the mud and to be a good witness because we're separating ourselves more all the time from wrong thinking and wrong activity, and we're seeing it more clearly for what it is. Amen.